Well, good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are currently in the book of Revelation. Tonight, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 18 to 29. And I'm going to do part one on the corrupt church, the church of Thyatira. This is where it really gets interesting. This is where it really kicks in. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and Father, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the things you continue to teach us, to reveal to us. Lord, I pray for this teaching because I know that when your truth is coming out, that people are going to feel that they've been hit on. And I, I just ask that nobody's offended by what's taught. This is all history. You can search this back and find the truth to all this, the dates, the times, and everything. And Father, I just ask that uh, tonight we would all have an open mind and an open spirit and have your spirit teach us and show us and reveal to us the things about this church that began here with Thyatira. Father, it's a heavy lesson. And it's something that we need to uh, know as far as religion and being a Christian and following your word that is in the Holy Bible. Go before us. Bless and anoint it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we began the Lord's letters to the seven churches with the church of Ephesus, which was the beginning of the Christian church. Ephesus was known as the loveless backslidden church. Jesus said the people were busy, but they had left their first love. What was their first love? Jesus Christ. They were caught up in the motions and the works of it all. The second church was Smyrna. It was known as a persecuted church because of the severe persecution that the believers had to endure. Historically, the church of Smyrna was established around AD 100 and continued until about AD 312. Now remember, these seven churches are seven stages in the last 2000 years of church history. That's why I'm giving you the dates of each of these particular churches. The third church was Pergamos. It was known for its compromising of biblical doctrine with the practices of the Babylonian cults. Both Roman and church history tell us that Constantine, who had been intrigued by Christianity, supposedly saw this vision of a fiery cross in the sky. He claims to have heard a voice saying, in this sign, conquer, as he was preparing to go to battle. By AD 312, Constantine had become so affected by the idea of Christianity, he made it a state religion. It became a state religion. Everyone in the Roman Empire became a Christian by decree of the emperor. Now, here's what you need to understand. The decree made any existing religious practice as Christianity. Any religious practice, they made it as Christianity, whether it had anything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ or not. This is where it all went south. From AD 312 on, the church became more Roman and less Christian in practice. It became polluted because of all the things that were imported from Romanism into Christianity. This is what made it a man-made religion. This was the beginning of Roman Catholicism and its man-made traditions. Tonight we come to the fourth church, the church of Thyatira, known as the corrupt church. Let's look what Jesus had to say to this church, verse 18. 
and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Check that out. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here we go. I'm going to give you some background to this city called Thyatira. The city was founded in the early 4th century by Seleucid I. Some believe it could have been founded by Alexander the Great a century earlier. Thyatira was about 30 miles southeast of Pergamus and 30 miles northwest of Sardis. Sardis is the next church, the fifth church that we will be getting into. Here's what's interesting. The longest message that Christ sends to the church is the smallest city. <laughs> it's in the smallest city, Lydia who in Philippi became Paul's first convert in Europe. She came from Thyatira. We see that in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Remember the scripture says that she was a seller of purple cloth. It was a commodity that actually literally made Thyatira famous throughout the ancient world. The name Thyatira means continual sacrifice continual sacrifice. Thyatira was the gateway that led to Pergamus, which was the capital city of Asia. Rome stationed their elite, all their elite guards in Thyatira, because if Thyatira fell by an invading army, then the path would be wide open to invade Pergamus. Think about that a minute. You know what that means? That means Thyatira's whole function in history was to fight a delaying action until Pergamus was ready to fight. How tragic to have lived in Thyatira. Thyatira was a town fated to fight, be captured, destroyed, and then be rebuilt again. Can you imagine living in that with that hanging over your head? Today, the ruins of Thyatira cover the distance of about one block. That's all that's left of it. The city also boasted of a special temple to Apollo, the sun god, which could explain why Jesus introduced himself as the son of God. In fact, this is the only time in the book of Revelation you see that title used. Jesus gave the Apostle John the job of delivering a message of severe warning and judgment to this fellowship. No doubt it would explain the description of the Lord's eyes and feet. Here's the most prominent characteristic of the church in Thyatira. 
Are you ready for this? I hope you're seated down. It was its man-made works instead of understanding biblical doctrine. I mean, we see so much of this today in our day. People would rather listen to and obey man-made traditions in religious churches than to study and know what God's word has to say about something. I've heard people tell me, well, my pastor in our religion says we need to do this or that. And they'll sit there and argue with me when I try to explain to them, here's what the Bible says about that. Are you going to take this dude's word for it, man-made religion, over the authority of God's word? Remember, God's word is the final ether authority for all eternity. It's amazing to me. They'd rather believe a tradition and hold on to it instead of relying on the truth of God's word and what the Bible has to say about a certain thing. The church at Thyatira takes us back to a time that is known as the Dark Ages, around AD 590 to about AD 1000. It was a really dark time. It's known that the city had many trade guilds and it would have been hard to make a living without participating in one of these trade guilds. You see, these guilds practice idolatrous rites when they got together. They were things the scriptures forbid Christians from practicing. Christians weren't able to practice that. That's what made it tough for Christians in Thyatira to support their families. They'd have to choose to compromise in some way with idolatry. What happened is there came up in the church a self-professed prophetess symbolically called Jezebel because of the similarity of her influence on the church to that of the original Jezebel on Israel. Remember King Ahab in the Old Testament? His wife's name was Jezebel. She had authority over all the prophets of Baal and, and all this stuff. Remember when uh, Elijah, he called fire down from heaven and had them all killed? Jezebel sent to Elijah and said, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like one of them, man. You're going to be dead meat. And he went running <laughs> and went into a cave. I mean, it's amazing. Well, this is being compared to her and the authority and power she had on Israel back in those days through her husband, King Ahab. She taught idolatrous practices. She actually allowed them. She encouraged fornication and even was involved in it with the members of the church. Can you imagine that? This era in the church was similar to the doctrine of Balaam. Remember, we studied that in the church of Pergamos. But here's the difference. The doctrine was promoted by a woman and there were men committing fornication with her. The church in the church. Some believe she gave her insights as the deep things of God. You know, it made me remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 in verses 10 to 12. Listen to what Paul said. He said, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, the Holy Spirit that's living in us. For this spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So she was teaching a superior enlightenment concerning grace. But Paul came against that in Romans 6, verses 15, 16. Paul said, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. What's the matter with you guys? I'll come out and slap each one of you. <laughs> You can't do it. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, 
you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. In the book of Jude, the book just before the book of Revelation, we read in verses three to four, remember Jude was a half brother to Jesus. Joseph and Mary uh, were Jude's parents. Mary was Jesus' mom. He said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed into the church, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is what was going on and what I believe Jude was possibly referencing going on in Thyatira. That word contend in its translation from the Greek Aramaic text has in it the idea of agony. So Jude is saying to contend or literally defend the doctrines of Christianity, the faith being the truth of the gospel that's been given to you and me. If this is what was going on, then there is a deliberate irony in Christ declaring these teachings as the depths or the deep things of Satan. It's what he was referring to, man. What was going on with this prophetess and the fornication going on in the church, the lewdness. <clears throat> Jesus reveals himself to this church as the son of God. He tells him his eyes are like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. Well, for those of you who are students of the scripture, a flame of fire and fine brass both suggest what? Impending judgment. His piercing vision sees everything. Therefore, he's going to judge rightly. His feet will tread on the wicked in the winepress of God's wrath, just at the incredible strength of brass. Jesus is pointing to the fact that he will judge the wicked in the church with a judgment that no one will get away from or be able to resist. I mean, in many respects, the church in Thyatira was a good church. I mean, the Christians apparently had plenty of works. They had love. They were involved in service. They had faith and they had patience. In fact, Jesus said their works were increasing. Remember he said the last are more than the first? Man, you guys are doing more now than you did in the beginning. But during this dark period of church history, many so-called Christian doctrines were established through a compromise of biblical doctrines and pagan teachings. Biblical doctrine and pagan teachings, they brought them together as God's word. This is where it started right here. I'm gonna ask you to hold on your seats. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to share because it's gonna knock your socks off. But you can, again, go back and verify all of this. As a result of bringing biblical doctrine and these pagan teachings and these man-made traditions, listen to the list of doctrinal highlights of the Church of Thyatira. Title of Pope given to Boniface III by Emperor Phocas, A.D. 607. Doctrine of Kissing the Pope's Foot, A.D. 709. Worship of the Cross, Images and Rallies, Authorized, A.D. 786. Use of Holy Water, A.D. 850. Canonization of dead saints by Pope John the 15th, A.D. 995. <clears throat> That's a canonization was a declaration of a deceased person to be an officially recognized saint. 
show me that, show me this stuff in the Bible. It goes on. Fasting on Fridays during Lent, AD 998. Celibacy of the priesthood by Gregory VII. Priests and nuns were forbidden to marry, AD 1079. That's a shock because they claim Peter was the first pope and Peter was married. <gasps> How do we know this? Remember Peter's wife's mother was sick and Jesus healed her, Matthew 8, 14, Mark 1, 30, and Luke 4, 38. Mechanical praying with beads, the rosary, invented by Peter the Hermit, A.D. 1090. The Inquisition, A.D. 1184. The Inquisition was a searching examination or an investigation. Sale of indulgences, A.D. 1190. It was a remission of part or all of the temporal and especially purgatorial punishment that according to Roman Catholicism is due for sins whose eternal punishment has been remitted and whose guilt has been pardoned. Well, Jesus said that you can't come to the Father apart from me. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you want your sins forgiven, it's through him and the blood shed at the cross. It's not some tradition or something handed down by man, or from another pagan religion that's gonna have your sins forgiven so you can go to heaven. There's transubstantiation established, A.D. 1215. It was a change into another substance in the sacraments that we take Holy Communion with, the, the bread and the, the juice. The wine became blood and the bread became body and flesh. Now, I can kind of see where they got that from. Jesus had spoke about it in John chapter six, and, and the disciples thought he was talking about cannibalism. Well, as you read on in the verses in John six, Jesus clarified his words were spirit and not to be taken as literal. But here it is coming into the church. Establishment of the communion wafer, A.D. 1220. The Bible forbidden to laymen. That meant only priests could read the Bible. The priest would inform the people of God's message, A.D. 1229. That means you couldn't read your Bible. Communion cup forbidden to the people. Come on, man. The sacrament that Jesus gave with his disciples and then gave to the apostle Paul to give to the church? The communion cup forbidden to the people, A.D. 1414. The doctrine of purgatory, decreed by Council of Florence, A.D. 1439. Purgatory was said to be a holding place for the dead that died without Christ so that their sins could be taken care of and they could still go to heaven. I kind of know where they got that. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31, the rich man and Lazarus. But that's not purgatory. <laughs> All those that are down in the center of the earth called Sheol, Hades, Guyana, you know, with the Hebrew and, and the Greek Aramaic names, they're all waiting for Revelation chapter 20, the white throne judgment. Nobody's coming out of there. Seven sacraments affirmed, including baptism, penance, holy communion, confirmation, holy matrimony, holy orders, and extreme unction, A.D. 1439. Ava Maria approved A.D. 1508. That's using Hail Mary in the first words of a prayer or doing the rosary. Jesuit priesthood order founded by Ignatius Loyola, A.D. 1534. Here's the kicker. You ready for this one? A.D. 
1545, Roman Catholic tradition granted equal authority with the Bible. Apocryphal books. There are, they, these are the historical books in the Catholic Bible between the Old and New Testaments. They were added to the Bible by the Council of Trent. These books are not accepted as inspired literature by the Protestant movement, but they do contain historical information. A.D. 1546. <clears throat> Immaculate Conception of Mary introduced. A.D. 1854. Syllabus of Errors proclaimed by Vatican Council, A.D. 1864. Infallibility of the Pope declared, 1870. In other words, the Pope is sinless. He can't sin. Show me that in the Bible. Public schools condemned by Pius XI, A.D. 1930. Assumption of the Virgin Mary proclaimed by Pius XII, A.D. 1950. Mary proclaimed to be the mother of the church by Paul VI, A.D. 1965. The latest thing in the Roman Catholic Church is the process of making Mary co-redemptive with Jesus Christ. In other words, the only way you're going to get to heaven is through Jesus and Mary. Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic monk in the early 16th century, he tried to satisfy the requirements of the Roman Catholic Church by nearly starving himself to death. He literally beat himself into unconsciousness in a regular ritual of penance and remorse. He felt by abusing his body, he could atone for his sins. But in his frustration, he was ready to leave the priesthood and give up his faith in God. He finally came to the conclusion there was nothing he could ever do to get rid of his sin, to take it completely away. While reading the book of Romans in the Bible, the doctrine of justification by faith alone opened his eyes where it said the just shall live by faith. In 1517, Luther wrote his now famous 95 point thesis. He nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. His thesis detailed 95 false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, needless to say, he was immediately excommunicated. This was the beginning of what we now know as a Reformation. Look at verse 18 again. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. One of the greatest heresies of the Roman Catholic Church through its rituals, man-made tra traditions, and its practices is a denial of the finished work of Christ on the cross. What does the scripture have to say about this? Hebrews 9, verses 24 to 28. Listen to this. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the truth. Everything we have down here are copies of the originals in heaven. But in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, <clears throat> not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, that took place on the Day of Atonement, when once a year the, the high priest of that year would go in behind the veil in the holiest of holies and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Well, that mercy seat spoke of Jesus Christ and his shed blood for us. It continues on here. 
He then would have to, had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Paul writing to Timothy said in 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus said in John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's, it's the only way. You can't do it through tradition or man's traditions. Jesus has six words of commendation for the church of the dark ages because there were still many true, genuine believers. I'm going to finish with this. First, he mentioned works. These came from true believers. There were many who lived spotless lives, and by their good works they followed the doctrine of the Bible, the holy scriptures, and not the traditions of men. Second one, love. This was a church filled with love, in spite of it being involved in ritualism. Now we know of some true believers during this dark period of church history. You may have heard a couple of these names. Bernard of Clairvoy, Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, John Hess, men who were in the Roman church. The third one is faith. Because of their faith, works and love followed. That's what faith does. Fourth was ministry. They were faithfully serving in the ministry. The fifth is patience. The fifth is patience. This was endurance of living in those days of darkness. The sixth, the last are more than the first. In this church, their works increased. Every one of these six virtues are found in each spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. Phillips Brooks said, be such a man and live such a life that if every man were such as you and every life such as yours, this earth would be God's paradise. <laughs> Next time, part two, the church of Thyatira, the corrupt church. We're going to break down the scriptures to get a clearer meaning of what Jesus was declaring. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the things you continue to reveal to us, God. Father, I pray that as you open up our eyes to the things that have take, taken place in the last 2,000 years and where these things came from, that we would understand, Lord, and know that we need to stick only with your word because your word is truth. It's the final truth. God, go before us. Bless the rest of this week, Lord, as we lift it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody said, amen. Amen, Lola. Say amen. <laughs> I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday as we continue in Daniel. Blessings.